and it just exploded feces all over us and this priceless car. A couple of years ago, I was in Pebble Beach for the Car Week, and of course the Concourse de Illegals, a very fancy event, which is made up, of course, of some of the most incredible vintage, classic, historic machinery, cars and the like uh, that you've ever seen. And one of the sort of, it's not really a stipulation, it's kind of like bonus points available uh, for the concourses to do their, their rally, I suppose, early on in the week. It's kind of one of the first events that happens, I think it's on the Thursday every year, and a good percentage, 60 or 70% of the cars entered in the concourse, do a big drive along the PCH, down to Big Sur and come back and then park up in Carmel by the sea. And so lots of people can then see some of the cars actually on the road rather than on uh, the Pebble Beach golf course. So it's a really cool event. And the first time I ever did it, I was invited by a friend of mine to join him in his family's Ferrari 250 Testarossa. And now this is one of Ferrari's most successful racing cars of all time, one of their most iconic. But this particular car is also one of the most important because it was the car that won the 1958 Le Mans race. And it was actually the first time that an American won at Le Mans, Phil Hill. So the car is stunning, beautiful, amazing, but also super important and super valuable. As with any car like that, there's an argument that it's priceless, uh, but it depends on the buyer and the market. But it's definitely one of the most important Ferraris that was ever made and ever raced. And so the criteria for the day was that I had to wake up at about 5.30 a.m., go and meet my friend, take the car down to the start line for about 6 a.m., where you then wait for like two hours, whilst I guess everyone else comes and joins and people get a chance to look at the car. If you're ever displaying a car for a concourse de elegance, uh, you're likely to be someone who's pretty fastidious about the preparation of that car. I don't really know all the criteria that goes into each concourse, like what what judges are looking for. It's often authenticity, sometimes it's condition, but there's an argument to say that original condition, whether that's absolutely awful or brand new condition, is worth more. So sometimes patinel, patina, or however you want to refer to it, i.e. original scratch marks and dents, sometimes add more to the car's credibility to something that looks perfectly restored. But I believe that history and originality are the most important elements. But for Pebble Beach, showing that the car runs and works is a really important part of actually being awarded with a prize or being judged. So the way they do that is by putting on this rally a few days before. And so why so many people try and do it is to show, look, the car works, we use the car, it's in running order. And so then the judges go, tick, they've done that, and it adds towards your sort of score. I don't know how to phrase it, but a lot of the... Uh, the owners or collectors who are inherently more passionate, maybe, about driving, there we go, more passionate about driving, will take their cars in the rally because they really use their cars. And my friend and his family really use their cars. So it wasn't a question for them to be able to roll their cars out to take part in this rally, and it goes towards their eventual score, so why not? But for sure, there are a lot of collectors who are in it for other reasons. These cars are uh, absolutely crazy in terms of their value, also stunning pieces of art. So some people would like to just look at them and they don't always like to drive them. And so it's more effort, also more opportunity for things to go wrong to try and get the car running. So they'll just trailer it in, push it onto the lawn and hope that it's originality and condition give it enough points to win over something that's been in the rally. And that definitely does happen. But uh, either way, once the cars run on the Thursday, it needs to be prepared once again for the Sunday. But again, I think if you are entering a car into an event as... Uh, prestigious as the Pebble Beach concourse. You probably have people around you who can prepare the cars in such a way. Uh, and so uh, knowing people that have entered cars before, they do. They, you know, they have teams who can help wash them down and prepare them. But except the actual rally on the Thursday, at Pebble Beach at least, once the car's on that lawn, it, then that's it. It's done. You know, I guess it doesn't, need to, doesn't want to be leaking oil everywhere, but as long as it's there and in good condition, it's not going to get marked down too much from that. So it's a really interesting world. I think a very different world to the one that I usually spend time around. I'm really bad at cars pre-1960, but it's amazing to see that sort of array and the care and the history that uh, is on display at the Pebble Beach concourse for sure. Um, but yeah, 60s forward, I'm a little bit more uh, enthusiastic about. 
So, you know, by the time we set off, we were already feeling a little bit sleepy. But don't get me wrong, I'm a big Ferrari fan and the opportunity to ride in that car, but also at an event as prestigious as the Pebble Beach. Concourse was definitely uh, one that I wasn't forgetting. So I was in good spirits and I thought, right, time to try and make a video because let's face it, it's not every day of the week that something like this happens. Uh, and definitely you don't see many period raced 250 Testarossas being driven around. So I wanted to sort of tell the story of this specific car because it's super interesting. Not only was it the first time an American had won at Le Mans, but the actual way that Phil Hill ended up being the winning driver was quite an interesting one. Ferrari actually built that specific 250 Testarossa for another famous driver called Mike Hawthorne, who was an Alfa Romeo driver. Whilst at Alfa Romeo, he always had four spoke steering wheels. And so this is the only Ferrari 250TR with a four-spoke steering wheel because Mike Hawthorne wanted it. Unfortunately, uh, Mike Hawthorne died in a race prior or an earlier race that season. And so Phil Hill was drafted in to race for the team in Mike Hawthorne's car. But he did end up going on and winning and it did sort of like the main stint, drove through the night like a madman and uh, it was a very well-celebrated victory. The 250TR, the car ran Perfectly. I mean, perfectly. As I say, I know that my friend's family keep it running a lot and they use it a lot. It's not a showpiece. None of their cars are. They get them out, they drive them as much as they can and they get real enjoyment from that. I will say, however, though, I think later that afternoon they had a small mechanical issue. I don't really know exactly what, but I was just grateful that it hadn't happened in the morning. A car like that, that is effectively a race car, uh, which you're now driving around on the street, is always going to be pretty highly strung. But it, no, it ran perfectly and it sounds so good. I think maybe they've dialed it down a little bit since it's actual Le Mans running days, just so that it's a better road car and not quite as highly strung. But it's amazing when you get in something like that, the flex you feel, the way it moves, the experience you're having, and to think that somebody raced in that for 24 hours, night and day. It's a whole different mentality to what you look at now as endurance racing. So I go, right, we've got to tell the story because sure, it's great that I'm in this sort of priceless car, but the story of this particular car is what's so interesting. So I put my camera on and I asked my friend to tell the story. He's very good at, at explaining the history of the family's cars. And he's just getting going and he's explaining this kind of Mike Hawthorne link. When we pass under some trees and I just sort of suddenly feel like some liquid being thrown at me. And I think, oh no, the car's like blown something. There's a leak or so. I'm looking around and I'm like, wow, what's happened? And I sort of look over me and there's white paint everywhere. And I'm like, oh no, what's happened? And I look at my friend, he's covered in white paint. And I'm going, oh, and I'm looking, but the car's running perfectly. And I realized that we just passed under a big tree. And I look over my shoulder and realize that it's bird poo. And we haven't been pooed on by a bird. We've been diarrheaed on by a bird. I honestly don't know what was in that tree, but it was not well. And it just exploded feces all over us and this priceless car. And the best thing is that it's a very dear friend of mine who owns it with his family. And... He just started laughing. You know, most people in that situation would have freaked out. I have to rescue the paintwork. This is awful. But we both just got absolute hysterics. And so for members of the public standing on the side of the road watching this amazing, you know, rally of vintage classic cars coming through and the other entrance saw these two far too young people to be driving such a valuable car driving around covered in bird poo, like, covered in the stuff, laughing our absolute faces off. And we get to some kind of stop at the top of a hill and just started wiping it off as best as we could with just, you know, that blue naff paper that you would never go near your car if you were a car guy. But my friend was like, come on, we gotta get it off. Like we can't like do the rest of the event. There's lots of photos gonna be taken. We're wiping each other's hats, our faces. There's just stuff everywhere. And people are coming up going, what are you doing? And again, just with complete hysteria, we're telling everyone how we've just been diarrheaed on by a bird. Definitely a, a, a memorable experience. Um, but we cleaned the car up, did the, the rest of the rally uh, with a little bit of you know poo still on our jackets and our, our heads. But it was just spectacular. That car was one of the most amazing ones I've ever been in my life. Obviously no roof, completely open uh, cockpit. The noise of it is insane and taking it on the PCH as the clouds cleared, letting it roar, it was, uh, yeah, possibly one of the best in-car experiences I've ever had. And it was from the passenger seat. So I wasn't even driving it, but I was super, super happy. And I've got some great photos from us having a great time 
covered in poo uh, in a really iconic car. We'd like to thank Avalon King for their continued support of the VinWiki YouTube channel. Obviously, I've installed it onto my Porsche 993, which one of our app users is going to win once we hit a million subscribers. I've got it on the LP640, and it's performed flawlessly in both cases. The cars are much easier to clean, the finish looks a lot better, and I've really been impressed with it. So we're going to do some more experimentation with the ceramic coating this month, but please do check out the link in the description below. Enter the code VinWiki for a discount, and thank them for supporting your favorite YouTube channel.